He will definitely try. Clearly. Hello, everybody. All right. We're back. We're live. Welcome to another thrilling installment of the Isolated Literary Society Presents. Question mark? <laughs> uh, I didn't put a title on the video because when I made the video page, I had not decided yet. Oops. Sorry, I put my um, I put my phone on mute, but the alarm comes through when it's on mute. It still goes for alarms. Anyway, um, so uh, when I made the video page, I still had not decided yet uh, what I was going to read. So um, that is why this is a exciting uh, announcement. What could possibly be now? Uh, hello, Savvy. Hello, Tila. Uh, thanks for being on time. Tila, I'm glad you could join us live. Um, during my last series, I said I was thinking about uh, reading some of my original work for this series. And uh, I spent the last week that I had off after finishing Cowboy Things looking through my stories. And other than the three that I recently published as an audiobook, link down below, uh, none of them were really ready to be read in, in to the public. So I decided I would give myself a little more time. I did spend the last week working on my longest short story, almost novella length. Uh, and just thought I'd see how far I could get. And maybe I would actually get to the point where I'd be like, yes, I can read this. And it would, you know, maybe only take a day or two to read it, but you know, figured I could get through it. Uh, however, it's been a real stressful, real, real stressful week. Bad stuff happened that I was not anticipating. And it kind of, my productivity took a hit. So I was definitely not able to get that story in in shape. And I just decided not to stress myself out. So at some point in the future, I will do a little series of reading some of my work. But I'm going to give myself time to get it in, uh, you know, ship shape condition. So, oh, we have another uh, East Coaster. Oh, working for a school in Mumbai. Wow. Ooh. Uh, that's very interesting. Interesting uh, life situation. <laughs> Having to uh, work for a place that it is tomorrow there. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's cool. Uh, so anyway, I decided to do... Um, well, I thought about just taking another week off because it's been a pretty stressful week. I thought maybe I should just give myself more time altogether. But I really like doing these readings. I like having this little uh, outlet um, uh, to chat with you guys. And I wanted to do another uh, reading. So I just decided to go with something easy. I don't have to ask anybody's permission. Uh, and it's low stress. So we will be reading Jane Austen's Persuasion. Daily Austen has returned. Uh, in case you missed it, I did um, Pride and Prejudice first. That's not archived because I just did it on Instagram. And then I did Emma, which is uh, archived here on the YouTube. Uh, and then I got bored with <laughs> doing uh, Regency novels, specifically just one author. So decided to branch out. Uh, unlike Pride and Prejudice, which I know quite well, uh, and Emma, which I had never read before, uh, but had seen the movie quite recently. So I had the story pretty strong in my head, even though I hadn't read the book. Uh, Persuasion, I've only read once before, and it has been a number of years. Uh, this book, this particular copy, was gifted to me by my dear sister, who unfortunately couldn't be here for uh, the first installment today, but I'm sure she'll be back. Um... I was having a very bad time. I was going through a very bad breakup and she sent me a uh, care package that had this book, which I hadn't read before, uh, some chocolate and some other fun stuff and also socks with bees on them. <laughs> so pretty great. Hello, Erin. No, you're not too late at all. I just announced that I'm going to be doing uh, Jane Austen's Persuasion uh, because I decided my... Well, you already know this. <laughs> you're my brother. I already talked to you about this. But... <laughs> 
yeah, decided I'm going to um, give myself a little more time to work on the my original stuff uh, so it's in good shape to read to you guys. So, uh, real quick, uh, Pepper's here. I know everybody wants to see Pepper. There he is. Say hello to your adoring public, Pepper. No, don't look at me. Look at them. <laughs> Pepper, look over here. Hey, over here. Goofball. You little dork. All right. Well, that's Pepper. He's still doing great. He had a great uh, week off. It was pretty much the same as uh, the weeks on. He, <laughs> he naps. He gets pets. He gets fed. He sits out on the balcony and upsets dogs passing by. Mm, this yes. is his life. This is what he does. <laughs> it's a little paw. He's like, what? No. I'm not done with you. Sorry, buddy. You get more pets later. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, uh, other than that, uh, Carolyn and I are doing okay. And uh, just uh, getting ready for my birthday next weekend. Very exciting. Yeah, not very exciting because honestly, it's probably oh. the most. Like, <laughs> you guys, I'm sorry. Look, Pepper has got his paw. He's like, hey, 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 you were. Don't stop. All right. It's like whatever you're doing, you can do it one handed. <laughs> you little goofball. You must have. Oh, yes, I know. I'm so cruel to you. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been. It's been bit of a stressful time to try and do anything for your birthday <laughs> but uh yeah i'm gonna my brother's gonna come over and we're gonna well, excuse me watch uh, some live streams from what would have been a music festival that we would have been at this weekend if uh things had not you know exploded <laughs> <laughs> he's got both paws around my arm right now. It's like, he's just like, hey. That's so adorable. You belong to me. This hand is for my use. Yes. Exclusively. Look at that adorable little nugget. Look at that ugly pillow sitting on the couch. So <laughs> I didn't plan to be in frame, but anyway. Okay, so anyway, that's enough going back and forth and, and pepper footage. Never enough pepper footage. Yes. Indeed. All right, Pepper. I'm sorry. I need my other hand. No. <laughs> it's like, what? No, stop. Bring the hand back. It belongs to me. Yeah. Anyway, I know I showed you guys that edition because I just, I, I like the art on the cover, but I'm actually going to read this copy, which is Carolyn's copy because <laughs> it's paperback and lighter weight. So, yeah. He, you, yes, Tila, he is a little man. Mm. That's what he is. He's got his cute little kerchief we got mm -hmm. from the vet. His little summer ensemble. Right before I started, uh, Carolyn said, he's our little mascot. He's our mascot with an ascot. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> it made me very happy. That's right. That's who you are, Pepper. You have, mm -hmm. a, ca you have a catchphrase now. You have a tagline. You have a slogan. That's better. <laughs> slogan. All right. So let's get into it, folks. Let's read Persuasion. I've read this once before. It's been a number of years. And honestly, I remember very little about the plot. And I've never seen an adaptation of it. So um, we'll have to find a few because yeah, I, well, have, well, I have thoughts about book versus adaptation. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. Well, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Two different people type mascot with an ascot in all caps. So I think they approve of your slogan. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Savvy just mentioned uh, she got the Cowboy Fangs book in the mail, and she told me it just doesn't have the musical like note, the note in back about uh, the the music about folk music and the list of of the songs referenced. Oh, really? it's just not in there. That's weird. I know. I was really looking forward to see like what the updated version would be. I just took it out. Yeah, that is weird. Somebody, somebody asked Stephen like. What? Steve, what the hell? Yeah. Anyway. Anywho. That's a little, little wrap up from the last series. This is the longest I've ever gone without actually starting to read, I think. Um, not counting the time we had to do the character catch up. I don't think we'll need to do that in, uh, in Persuasion. So. Hopefully not. 
Let's do know. it. Sometimes with Jane Austen, I have to. That's true. All right. Let's do this, y'all. I'm going to have to put a note in the video that's like, if you wish to skip ahead to the beginning of the book, go to 10 minutes in. <laughs> if you have done that, hello. It's just a lot of chatting and catching up and some Talking about footage, footage of my cat. Yes. Um, which, you know, you might want to check that out. But if you wanted to skip ahead to 10 minutes, now here you are. We're reading Jane Austen's Persuasion. I've read it once, but it's been a long time. I've never seen adaptation. There we are. We're all caught up. Chapter one. Sir Walter Elliot of Kellynch Hall in Somersetshire was a man who, for his own amusement, never took up any book but the baronetage. Baronetage? Baronetage. You Sounds know? right. Either one's probably fine. I, I couldn't <laughs> say for sure. No. <laughs> it's capitalized, so I assume it's a thing. It's the... Um, it's a book that just talks about all the aristocrats and who they are. And, it's ooh, like the, the ooh, period... Who's or, your mother? Who are your aunts and uncles? Yes. It's the, the who's who that is referenced in uh, older British works. Oh. Peter Whimsey has one as well. Oh, I see. I think they call it uh, so-and-so's peerage now. Oh, okay. I think I was aware that such a thing existed. Yes. In case yeah. you need to look up, in case someone tells you their name and you have to go to the book and look it up and be like, oh, are you one of the, <laughs> the, Whit the Shropshire Whitworths? Yeah, exactly. There he found occupation for an idle hour and consolation in a distressed one. There his faculties were roused into admiration and respect by contemplating the limited remnant of the earliest parents. There any unwelcome sensations arising from domestic affairs changed naturally into pity and contempt as he turned over the almost endless creations of the last century. And there, if every other leaf were powerless, he could read his own history with an interest which never failed. <laughs> this was the page at which the favorite volume always opened. Eliot of Kellynch Hall. Walter Eliot, born March 1st, 1760, married July 15th, 1784, Elizabeth, daughter of James Stevenson Esquire of South Park in the count, uh, county of Gloucester. Gloucester. Sorry, yes. Forgot how to pronounce that one for a yeah. second. By which lady, who died 1800, he has issue. Look, I have issues with my dead wife. <laughs> Elizabeth, born June 1st, 1785. Anne, born August 9th, 1787. That's one day after my birthday. What? And I are birthday buddies. How did we plan this so that, that we're perfect. reading it on her birthday? A stillborn son, November 5th, 1789. Mary, born November 20th, 1791. Gotta Honestly, make sure that kind of rude to put a stillborn child in there it's it's oh it's weird to not it, like if you had picked a name out and what have you might you know like I guess, maybe yeah. but th it, it does feel like yeah i guess it was yeah stillborn not like lived a few days and then died yeah. some, you know infant illness yeah they just had to mention like look we were capable of having a boy okay we just wanted to right yeah we 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 almost got there all yeah. right we tried i assume so yeah I mean, I hmm. guess this is probably self-reported, but still, that just feels like really invasive. That's true. Uh, but I that's think also a I very modern imagine. sensibility. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. All right. Precisely such had the paragraph originally stood from the printer's hands. But Sir Walter had improved it by adding, for the information of himself and his family, these words after the date of Mary's birth. Married December 16, 1810. Charles, son and heir of Charles Musgrove, Esquire of Uppercross, in the county of Somerset. And by inserting most accurately the day of the month on which he had lost his wife. You imagine just having like a book, but just like for the record of, of the nation. Yeah. Just has your family information, but you're like, well, I can't expect them to release a new uh, edition every time something happens. So I'll just hand write it in yeah. just until we get the next edition, you know, just in case. It's so weird. Cause this is also when people used to write those things like in the family Bible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like people had huge Bibles with like, Oh, pages huge, and pages of a huge of, first section that was just for like just family, for family. Yeah, yeah. It makes sense though. I mean, there. Well, uh, uh, government records didn't used to be quite so thorough. That is true. So this was for a lot of people. That was the only way to keep track of of their family history. Yes, yes. It's just funny to me that uh, Sir Walter. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> Aaron just, I believe, referred to the Baronetage as Teen Bop for Brit Fops. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's true that uh, the 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 teen magazines back in the day did used to include important information about, you know, birth dates and uh, brothers and sisters that they had and what have you. It's true. What's their favorite color? Star sign, blood type, you know, yeah. whatever. What they're looking for in a girl. Yeah. <sighs> Jonathan Taylor Thomas's favorite kind of cheese is feta. <laughs> It's really important that I retain that information. Yeah. Because I'd never had it. And I went to my mom and said, mom, do you have any feta? And she said, yes, <laughs> which is kind of amazing. And I said, can I try some? She's like, sure. And I tried it. And just feta on its own when you are not expecting it is quite startling <laughs> as a child. And I just wanted child, to like definitely. the same kind of cheese as John LaTorre Thomas. So we'd have something to talk about on our first date. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> Back to that makes perfect sense. Back to persuasion makes perfect sense. Ah, uh, then followed the history and rise of the ancient and respectable family in the usual terms. How it had been first settled in Cheshire. How mentioned in Dugdale, 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 serving the office of High Sheriff, representing a borough in three successive parliaments. Exertions of loyalty and dignity of baronet. In the first year of Charles II, with all the Marys and Elizabeth they had married, forming a all together two handsome duodecimo pages, and concluding with the arms and motto, Principal Seat, Kellynch Hall, in the county of Somerset. And Sir Walter's handwriting again in this finale, heir presumptive, William Walter Elliot, Esquire, great-grandson of the second Sir Walter. Yeah. Heir presumptive. Mm. Vanity was the beginning and the end of Sir Walter Elliot's character. Vanity of person and of situation. He had been remarkably handsome in his youth, and at 54 was still a very fine man. Few women could think more of their personal appearance than he did, nor could the valet of any new-made lord be more delighted with the place he held in society. He considered the blessing of beauty as inferior only to the blessing of baronetcy. And the Sir Walter Elliot, who united these gifts, was the constant object of his warmest respect and devotion. Wait. Wait, so is he talking about himself or the, the heir? I think he's talking about himself. Okay. <laughs> that would make sense. But I do get confused it, when they say when the people... Sir Walter Elliot that you're talking, they're talking about himself. It's a little yeah. confusing when people have the same name. <laughs> yes, that is also true. And also refer to themselves in the third person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dude, listen, I genuinely thought game Jane was going to dunk on him there. I think this is her version of dunking, honestly. Yeah. His good looks and his rank had one fair claim on his attachment. Since to them he must have owed a wife of very superior character to anything deserved by his own. Lady Elliot had been an excellent woman, sensible and amiable, whose judgment and conduct, if they might be pardoned, the youthful infatuation which made her Lady Elliot had <laughs> never required indulgence afterwards. <laughs> she had humored or softened or concealed his failings and promoted his real respectability for 17 years. And though not the very happiest being in the world herself, had found enough in her duties, her friends and her children to attach her to life and to make it no matter of indifference to her when she was called on to quit them. Oh, wow. She was happy enough that she was not indifferent about dying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> it's another time. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's a way of saying things. Yeah. Where did, where did I just to quit them? Where did I just lost? Absolutely. Hold on to quit them. Three girls, the two eldest, 16 and 14, was an awful legacy for a mother to bequeath. An awful charge, rather, to confide to the authority and guidance of a conceited, silly father. She had, however, one very intimate friend, a sensible, deserving woman, who had been brought by strong attachment to herself to settle close by her in the village of Kellynch. And on her, kindness, on, on her kindness and advice, Lady Elliot mainly relied for the best help and maintenance of the good principles and instruction which she had been anxiously giving her daughters. This friend and Sir Walter did not marry. Not is in italics. That's one to understand. <laughs> it's not one of those. Yeah. 
whatever might have been anticipated on that head by their acquaintance. Thirteen years had passed away since Lady Elliot's death, and they were still near neighbors and intimate friends, and one remained a widower and the other a widow. That Lady Russell, of steady age and character, and extremely well provided for, should have no thought of a second marriage needs no apology to the public, which is rather apt to be unreasonably discontented when a woman does marry again than when she does not. But Sir Walter's continuing in singleness requires explanation. <laughs> be it known, then, that Sir Walter, like a good father, having met with one or two private disappointments in very reasonable applications, prided himself on remaining single for his dear daughter's sake. <laughs> for one daughter, his eldest, he would really have given up anything, which he had not been much very tempted to do. Elizabeth had succeeded at 16 to all that was possible of her mother's rights and consequence, and being very handsome and very like himself, her influence had always been great, and they had gone on together most happily. His two other children were of very inferior value. Mary had acquired a little artificial importance by becoming Mrs. Charles Musgrove, but Anne, with an elegance of mind and sweetness of character, which must have placed her high with any people of real understanding, was nobody with either her father or sister. Her word had no weight. Her convenience was always to give way. She was only Anne. This is harsh. It's harsh. Yes. Inferior value. Yes. I feel like that's been repeated a lot. Only Anne. I remember when I first started reading the book and they mentioned Elizabeth and I'm like, is it going to be another Elizabeth book? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is going to be about another Elizabeth? Very different. Another Elizabeth, Elizabeth and Mary. <laughs> At least she calls out that, and all the Elizabeths and Marys yeah. that they had married. I mean, she acknowledges sense. that they are the very common names. But we've got yeah. an Anne now. So that's nice. That's a nice change of pace. Yeah. <sighs> very different Annes and uh Elizabeth. Maybe yeah, not I such guess a they're... different Mary, but yeah. very different Anne Elizabeth than in um, Pride and Prejudice. Right. Yes. Yes, indeed. Oh, I'm so sorry you have to leave us, Savvy. Well, you can always catch up uh, when the, the rest of the video is posted. Um, would you mind getting sure. your blinds, actually? It's later than usual. Yes. I guess that's bound to happen as the, as the year goes on. Indeed. <sighs> okay. <clears throat> She was only Anne. To Lady Russell, indeed, she was a most dear and highly valued goddaughter, favorite, and friend. Lady Russell loved them all, but it was only in Anne that she could fancy the mother to revive again. A few years before, Anne Elliot had been a very pretty girl, but her bloom had vanished early. Ouch. Yeah. And as, even in its height, her father had found little to admire in her, so totally different were her delicate features and mild dark eyes from his own, there could be nothing in them now that she was faded and thin, to excite his esteem. Wow. He had never indulged much hope. He had now none of ever reading her name in any other page of his favorite work. All equality of alliance must rest with Elizabeth, for Mary had merely connected herself with an old country family of respectability and large fortune, and had, therefore, given all the honor and received none. Mm. Elizabeth would, one day or other, marry suitably. <laughs> She had given all the honor and received none. <sighs> I do find it interesting about this book that the oldest daughter is considered the most eligible, even though she's not. Yeah, it's, it's met like it. Obviously, they're talking about Anne as having. Well, I guess I guess uh, Jane Austen means us to understand that Anne has had some things that weighed on her mind, whereas. Her older sister does not have anything weighing on her mind. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> it is odd that the oldest uh, uh, sister doesn't marry first, but I guess. Yeah. And that she's, yeah. I guess it, it's, just, she, it's repeatedly called out that she's, it's repeatedly noted she's the, the handsomest, the most eligible. Right. Yeah. When, by virtue of age alone, she is technically a spinster. Like, yeah, I guess uh, it may be the, this Charles Musgrove comes along and mm -hmm. is an option and well, he won't do for Elizabeth. Elizabeth has to marry no. up. But yeah. Ma Mary can marry down. That's fine. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah, Tila Mary... says for a book about Anne, she gets dunked on a lot. Well. Honestly, it's sort of refreshing, though, because heroines are often, like, kind of perfect. Yeah. Almost. Um, or well, at least the author thinks they're perfect. They're perfect. Too. Yeah. 
and it's yeah, and it's her family so far. Obviously, Lady Russell thinks how very happy of her. Yeah. Anyway, it sometimes happens that a woman is handsomer at twenty nine than she was ten years before. And generally speaking, if there had been ill health, if there had been neither ill health nor anxiety, it is a time of life at which scarcely any charm is lost. It was so with Elizabeth. Still the same handsome Miss Elliot that she had begun to be 13 years ago, and Sir Walter might be excused, therefore, in forgetting her age, or at least be deemed only half a fool for thinking himself and Elizabeth as blooming as ever, amidst the wreck of the good looks of everyone else. For he could plainly see how old all the rest of his family and acquaintance were growing. <laughs> Anne Haggard, Mary Corse, every face in the neighborhood worsting, and the rapid increase of the crow's foot about Lady Russell's temples had long been a distress to him. Oh, God. I mean, yeah, he's, he's good. He's good as a dick. Uh, Elizabeth did not quite equal her father in personal contentment. Thirteen years had seen her mistress of Kellynch Hall, presiding and directing with a self-possession and decision which could never have given the idea of her being younger than she was. For thirteen years she had been doing the honors, and laying down the domestic law at home, and leading the way to the chaise and four, and walking immediately after Lady Russell out of all the drawing rooms and dining rooms in the country. Thirteen winters revolving frosts had seen her opening every ball of credit which a scanty neighborhood afforded, and thirteen springs shone their blossoms as she traveled up to London with her father for a few weeks' annual enjoyment of the great world. She had the remembrance of all this. She had the consciousness of being nine and twenty, to give her some regrets and some apprehensions. She was fully satisfied of being still quite as handsome as ever, but she felt her approach to the years of danger, and would have rejoiced to be certain of being properly solicited by Bar Baronet Blood within the next twelve month or two. <laughs> Before she's thirty. That's it, or two. She's that's, acknowledging that's it could true. You know, but that's true. Probably. I'm sure she would prefer if it was before. What was it Lydia said? I should be ashamed to be 23 and still unmarried. Does she say that? Yeah, at, at some point in Pride and Prejudice. Well, Lord, I should be ashamed to be 23 and still. Well, Lydia is a fool. Yes, I think we can all agree. <laughs> and she has been raised to believe that marriage is the only important thing in yes. the world. So, well, she definitely got married before she was 23. So, in that sense, mission accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Oh, Teal said, fun fact, when I was very wee thing, I thought 9 and 20 meant someone was 920 years old. <laughs> mm, that makes sense. Like, oh, sweet. Vampire book? Awesome. All <laughs> oh, right. I've lost my... That's my point again. Uh, Elizabeth did not quite equal her father in personal contentment. No, wait. I already heard that yeah. part. Damn it. Uh, uh, next 12 months or two. There we go. Then might she again take up the book of books with as much enjoyment as in her early youth, but now she liked it not. Always to be presented with the date of her own birth and see no marriage follow but that of a youngest sister made the book an evil. And more than once, when her father had left it open on the table near her, had she closed it with averted eyes and pushed it away. <laughs> she had had a disappointment, moreover, which that book, and especially the history of her own family, must ever rep present the remembrance of. The heir presumptive, the very William Walter Elliot Esquire, whose rights had been so generously supported by her father, had disappointed her. Mm. She had, while a very young girl, as soon as she had known him to be, in the event of her having no brother, the future baronet, meant to marry him. And her father had always meant that she should. He had not been known to them as a boy. But soon after Lady Elliot's death, Sir Walter had sought the acquaintance. And though his overtures had not been met with any warmth, he had persevered in seeking it, making allowance for the modest drawing back of youth. And... In one of their spring excursions to London, when Elizabeth was in her first bloom, Mr. Elliot had been forced into the introduction. So this is... So that's like a... So he's Mr. Elliot. Got it. He is like a cousin of some kind, yeah? Yeah, they mentioned before that he was the... He's the heir because he's the eldest child of... Sir Walter's grandfather? Or, no, that can't be right. Yeah. No, I'm sure they'll get into it. He's the grandson. He's well, also the grandson of Sir Walter. They share a grandfather or something like yeah. that. Yeah. So they're like second cousins. 
he was at that time a very young man, just engaged in the study of law, and Elizabeth found him extremely agreeable, and every plan in his favor was confirmed. He was invited to Kellynch Hall. He was talked of and expected all the rest of the year, but he never came. The following spring, he was seen again in town, found equally agreeable, again encouraged, invited and expected, and again he did not come, and the next tidings were that he was married. Instead of pushing his fortune in the line marked out for the heir of the House of Elliot, he had purchased independence by uniting himself to a rich woman of inferior birth. Yeah, yeah there's a lot to be said for independence. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sir Walter, Sir Walter had resented it. Well, that is what you get for writing things in books <laughs> on, on assumptions. It's as the head of the house, he felt that he ought to have been consulted, especially after taking the young man so publicly by the hand. For they must have been seen together, he observed, once at Tattersall's and twice in the lobby of the House of Commons. His disapprobation was expressed, but apparently very little regarded. Mr. Elliot had attempted no apology and shown himself as unsolicitous of being no longer noticed by the family as Sir Walter considered him unworthy of it. All acquaintance between them had ceased. <laughs> How dare you not except the yeah the uh, uh, compliments that we have offered you by yes. clearly being uh, fine with you marrying one of uh, one of our daughters yes this very awkward history of mr elliot was still after an interval of several years felt with anger by elizabeth who had liked the man for himself and still more for being her father's heir and whose strong family pride could be could see only in him a proper match for Sir Walter well Elliot's eldest daughter. There was not a baronet from A to Z whom her feelings could have so willingly acknowledged as an equal. Yet so miserably had he conducted himself, that though she was at this present time, the summer of 1814, wearing black ribbons for his wife, she could not admit him to be worth thinking of again. The disgrace of his first marriage might, perhaps, as there was no reason to suppose it perpetuated an off by offspring, have been got over had he not done worse. But he had, as by the customary intervention of kind friends, they had been informed, spoken most disrespectfully of them all, most slightingly and contemptuously of the very blood he belonged to, and the honors which were hereafter to be his own. This could not be pardoned. So he just, like, talked shit about them? Yeah. And about his being the heir of Kellich Hall. Apparently, he doesn't that's think rude. that's... That doesn't mean nothing? Apparently not. Well, I, I certainly don't blame him for marrying whoever he wanted to marry, but don't be, don't be rude to your relations. Yes. I suppose they might have been a bit <laughs> rude to him, but uh, yes. who knows. Such were Elizabeth Elliot's sentiments and sensations, such the cares to alloy, the agitations to vary, the sameness and the elegance, the prosperity and the nothingness of her scene of life, such the feelings to give interest to a long, uneventful residence in one country circle, to fill the vacancies which there were no habits of utility abroad, no talents or accomplishments for home to occupy. Ah, oh, some of these sentences. Yeah. <laughs> we're back We're back into confusing sentence land. Yes. I had a little break by reading some more modern works, but now we're back. But now another occupation and solicitation of mind was beginning to be added to these. Her father was growing distressed for money. She knew that when he now took up the baronetage, it was to drive the heavy bills of his tradespeople and the unwelcome hints of Mr. Shepherd, his agent, from his thoughts. The Kellynch property was good, but not equal to Sir Walter's apprehension of the state required in its possessor. While Lady Elliot lived, there had been method, moderation, and economy, which had just kept him within his income. But with her had died all such right-mindedness, and from that period he had been constantly exceeding it. It had not been possible for him to spend less. He had done nothing but what Sir Walter Elliot was imperiously, imperiously called on to do. But blameless as he was, he was not only growing dreadfully in debt, but was hearing of it so often that it became vain to attempt concealing it longer, even partially from his daughter. He had given her some hints of it the last spring in town, had gone so far even as to say, Can we retrench? Does it occur to you that there is any one article in which we can retrench? And Elizabeth, to do her justice, had, in the first ardor of female alarm, set seriously to think what could be done, and had finally proposed these two branches of economy, to cut off some unnecessary charities, and to refrain from new furnishing the drawing room, 
To which expedient she afterwards added the happy thought of their taking no present down to Anne, as had been the usual yearly custom. <laughs> but these measures, however good in themselves, were insufficient for the real extent of the evil. Oh, really? Not bringing your sister home a, a present from your trip to town yeah. didn't solve all of your financial issues? Didn't, didn't bring and, you back into the black. Yeah. Cut, cutting back on some charities, not buying new furniture, and not bringing your sister a gift. Yeah. I mean, the not buying new furniture was a good move, but uh, it's not going to solve the problem. Yeah, I mean, that that was definitely a step in the right direction. But <sighs> when you've been doing it for years, it's going to have to it's gonna take a little more than that. But these measures, however good in themselves, were insufficient for the real extent of the evil, the hold of which Sir Walter found himself obliged to confess to her soon afterwards. Elizabeth had nothing to propose of deeper efficacy. She felt herself ill-used and unfortunate, as did her father, and they were neither of them able to devise any means of lessening their expenses without compromising their dignity, excuse me, or relinquishing their comforts in a way not to be borne. <laughs> there was only a small part of his estate that Sir Walter could dispose of, but had every acre been alien alienable, it would have made no difference. He had condescended to mortgage as far as he had the power, but he would never condescend to sell. No, he would never disgrace his name so far. The Kellynch estate could be transmitted whole and entire as he had received it. Should be transmitted. Sorry. Their two confidential friends, Mr. Shepherd, who lived in the neighboring market town, and Lady Russell, were called on to advise them, and both father and daughter seemed to expect that something should be struck out by one or the other to remove their embarrassments or reduce their expenditure without involving the loss of any indulgence of taste or pride. <laughs> So we, I need you to solve all of our problems, but I don't want to actually change anything about the way I live my life. Yes. Yes, well, I'm sure that'll be quite easy. Yes. Okay. Just looking at how long this next chapter is. Okay, cool. Sure run. I remember reading this book the first time being like, I can't tell who the main character is. <laughs> That's true. We, uh, we don't. For the entire first chapter, you kind of assume it's going to be more Elizabeth. Yeah. Although so far the only person we we've we've gotten nobody's point of view really. No one's right. We get a little bit of how uh uh, uh both Elizabeth and um and her father think, mm -hmm. but nothing like directly in their mind. Yeah. Really? It's, yeah, it's Anne hasn't been mentioned very much at all. Yeah. Yeah. Except to be dunked upon. Yes. <sighs> all right, Pepper, are you ready for chapter two? <laughs> chapter two. Mr. Shepherd, a civil, cautious lawyer, who, whatever might his uh, might be his hold or his views on Sir Walter, would rather have the disagreeable prompted by anyone else, excused himself from offering the slightest hint, and only begged leave to recommend an implicit reference to the excellent judgment of Lady Russell, from whose known good sense he fully expected to have just such resolute measures advised as he meant to see finally adopted. Lady Russell was most anxiously zealous on the subject and gave it much serious consideration. She was a woman rather of sound than of quick abilities, whose difficulties in coming to any decision in this instance were great. Sounds like a member of the Mosquito Fleet just passed by. Uh, oh, that is actually the, the name of a group of a local moped club, or it yeah. used to be. I don't know if they're still around. All right. Uh, she, 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 who's dif uh, she was a woman rather of sound than quick abilities, whose difficulties in coming to any decision in this instance were great, from the opposition of two leading principles. She was of strict integrity herself, with a delicate sense of honor, but she was as desirous of saving Sir Walter's feelings, as solicitous for the credit of the family, as aristocratic in her ideas of what was due to them, as anybody of sense and honesty could well be. She was a benevolent, char charitable, good woman, and capable of strong attachments, most correct in her conduct, strict in her notions of decorum, and with manners that were held a standard uh, that were held a standard of good breeding. She had a cultivated mind and was, generally speaking, rational and consistent, but she had prejudices on the side of ancestry. She had a value for rank and consequence, which blinded her a little to the faults of those who possessed them. Herself the widow of only a knight, she gave the dignity of a baronet all its due, and Sir Walter, independent of his 
claim as an old acquaintance, an attentive neighbor, an obliging landlord, the husband of a very dear friend, the father of Anne and her sisters, was, as being Sir Walter, in her apprehension, entitled to a great deal of compassion and consideration under his present difficulties. Oh, <sighs> they must retrench. That did not admit of a doubt. But she was very anxious to have it done with the least possible pain to him and Elizabeth. She drew up plans of economy, she made exact calculations, and she did what nobody else thought of doing. She consulted Anne, who never seemed considered by the others as having any interest in the question. She, con uh, she consulted and in a degree was influenced by her in marking out the scheme of retrenchment, which was at last submitted to Sir Walter. Every emendation of Anne's had been on the side of honesty against importance. She wanted more vigorous measures, a more complete reformation, a quicker release from debt, a much higher tone of indifference for everything but justice and equity. <laughs> Good old Anne. Yep. If we can persuade your father to all of this, said Lady Russell, looking over her paper, much may be done. I just realized this is the first dialogue in the book. This yes. is the first time a person has actually, like, spoken. Yes. It is uh, not... Well, technically, Sir Walter said something. That's true. But the way it was written, I almost didn't read it as dialogue. Yeah. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Thank you. explanation-heavy book. Not as much dialogue as others. Yeah, yeah. There's just a lot of telling in the first chapter and, uh, and very little showing, as Aaron pointed out. Yeah. If we can persuade your father to all of this, said Lady Russell, looking over her paper, much may be done. If he will adopt these regulations, in seven years he will be clear, and I hope we may be able to convince him and Elizabeth that Kellynch Hall has a respectability in itself, which cannot be affected by these reductions, and that the true dignity of Sir Walter Elliot will be very far from lessened in the eyes of sensible people by his acting like a man of principle. What will he be doing, in fact, but what very many of our first families have done or ought to do? There will be nothing singular in his case. And it is singularity which often makes the worst part of our suffering, as it always does of our conduct. I have great hope of our prevailing. We must be serious and decided, for, after all, the person who has contracted debts must pay them. And though a great deal is due to the feelings of the gentleman in the head of the house, like your father, there is still more due to the character of an honest man. Well, at least she admits that. Oh, <laughs> Deal said, I find that to be a common trend in Jane Austen. I have to sit down and read at least the half, first half of the book in one sitting to make sure I finish the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <clears throat> this was the principle on which Anne wanted her father to be proceeding, his friends to be urging him. He, she considered it as an act of indispensable duty to clear away the claims of creditors with all the expedition which the most comprehensive retrenchments could secure and saw no dignity in anything short of it. She wanted it to be prescribed and felt it as a duty. She rated Lady Russell's influence highly, and as to the severe degree of self-denial, which her own conscious pr prompt, conscience prompted, she believed there might be little more difficulty in persuading them to a complete than to half a reformation. Her knowledge of her father and Elizabeth inclined her to think that the sacrifice of one pair of horses would hardly be less painful than of both, and so on through the whole list of Lady Russell's two gentle reductions. How more and more rigid requisitions might have been taken is of little consequence. Lady Russell's had no success at all, could not be put up with, were not to be borne. What? Every comfort of life knocked off? Journeys, London, servants, horses, table, contractions and restrictions everywhere to live no longer with the decencies even of a private gentleman? No, he would sooner quit Kellynch Hall at once than remain in it on such disgraceful terms. Would he? I mean, that could very well be your choice, my dude. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. He just he just said that he wouldn't even sell off a part of the land, right. much less the house. Yeah. Quit Kellynch Hall. The hint was immediately taken up by Mr. Shepherd, whose interest was involved in the reality of Mr. Walter of Sir Walter's retrenching, who was perfectly persuaded that nothing could be done without a change of abode. Since the idea had been started in the very quarter which ought to dictate, he had no scruple, he said, in confessing his judgment to be entirely on that side. It's, again, we have, this is the like the stuff that where it's like, is this dialogue or not? It's like somewhere yeah. in between. We had yeah. a lot of that in Emma. Yeah. 
Uh, it did not appear to him that Sir Walter could materially alter his style of living in a house which had such a character of hospitality and ancient dignity to support. In any other place, Sir Walter might judge for himself and should, would be looked up to as regulating the modes of life in whatever way he might choose to model his household. <clears throat> did we just, Aaron just said we just had persuasion. Do you mean, did someone say the word persuasion? When's, I, I, was, I was wondering when we would get to the first use of the word persuasion oh. in this book. Oh, hi, Michelle. I'm sorry that you missed the first bit of it. Uh, we're reading Jane Austen's Persuasion. Uh, just so you know, I'm sure you'll go back to the beginning. But, oh, Aaron said persuade. The word persuade has been, has been the concept of persuasion has been introduced at least. But, yeah, yeah Michelle, just so you know, um, I'm still going to do my personal stuff later. It just... It all needs more editing and I'm a little too stressed right now to really focus on it because uh, editing your own short stories does not pay the bills, weirdly. Mm. Anyway, <clears throat> Sir Walter would quit Kellynch Hall and after a very few days more of doubt and indecision, the great question of whither he should go was settled and the first outline of this important change was made out. There had been three alternatives, London, Bath and another house in the country. All Anne's wishes had been for the latter. A small house in their own neighborhood, where they might still have Lady Russell's society, still be near Mary, and still have the pleasure of sometimes seeing the lawns and groves of Kellynch, was the object of her ambition. But the usual fate of Anne attended her in having something very opposite from her inclination fixed on. <clears throat> she disliked Bath, and did not think it agreed with her, and Bath was to be her home. <laughs> I'm sure there are plenty of people who... who can relate to that feeling. Yeah, it doesn't seem to, at least in this time period, at least in Jane Austen's opinion, Beth does not seem to have like a great, uh, it's not a place people live. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, were you saying something else? Oh, about that? no, I was, I was just, uh, my remark was more, um, I'm sure plenty of people can relate to the feeling of. Uh, oh, whatever. The complete opposite of whatever yes. your, <laughs> whatever your, your feelings. Yeah, wish contrary is to what is going to happen. Yeah, contrary to your uh, opinions being uh, or, or wishes being followed, yes, you end in up fact, with the exact the opposite. exact opposite yeah. is what's going to happen. That happened very quickly. We went. We spent a lot of time talking about how Sir Walter would never leave Kellynch Hall to suddenly be like, "Well, I guess he's going to leave Kellynch Hall." What? Yeah. Well, I mean, he won't. He won't sell Kellynch Hall. Oh, what is he going to? is going to go live somewhere Oh, else. And it's oh. going to be... Uh, to quit it doesn't necessarily mean to sell it. Okay. Yeah. It'll stay in the family, but they won't have to keep it up. Yeah. That actually makes a lot of so sense. So they can live... They can still have some of their extravagant lifestyle, but in a much smaller place. Right, yeah. In Bath. I mean, it's... It and is... they're going to be renting the house. Okay. This, Which that's what I, I think, wasn't sure about. Okay, we haven't gotten. To that I don't part. think they've actually said that. Yet, no, no, but that's no. The, they have not uh, said that. But I was. That's why I was trying to figure selling, out. They're not selling. They're not selling. The selling. Estate. Okay, I was like, are they the estate gonna, or the house? They're like, well, I guess he's gonna. <laughs> yes, Tila. Uh, they gonna. He's going to Airbnb it. H e i r. <laughs> it's a special uh, service uh, only for renting out to very uh, to extremely rich. Tila, is that people. a is that a good place joke? Well, no, um, Teela actually said regular Airbnb. I was making a good, oh, good place joke. Oh, you were making the... Okay. I was making a good place joke. Yes. No, no it's Airbnb. Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really good joke. Yeah. It was a good joke. Yeah. Yes, hi, Pepper. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm making good place jokes and not feeding you. I really do. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Bath was to be her home. Sir Walter had at first thought more of London. But Mr. Shepherd felt he could not be trusted in London <laughs> and had been skillful enough to dissuade him from it and make Bath preferred. It was a much safer place for a gentleman in his predicament. He might be important to comparatively at, he might be important at comparatively little expense. Yes. Two material advantages of Bath over London had of course given all their weight. It's more convenient distance from Kellynch, only 50 miles, and Lady Russell spending some part of every winter there. And to the very great satisfaction of Lady Russell, whose first views on the projected change had been for Bath, Sir Walter and Elizabeth were induced to believe that they should lose neither consequence nor enjoyment by settling there. There are a lot of other, there are a lot of, there's a lot of persuasion going on under different. 
Lots words. of different kinds of persuasion yes. happening so far, really. Yeah. Inducement. Oh, influence. good night, Erin. I'm sorry you have to leave early. <laughs> oh, Tila, if you have not watched The Good Place, highly recommend it. Uh, or if you're just behind on the show. I'm also behind on the show. I'm probably only a few episodes past that joke, in fact. But yeah. I think that's a, that's a season three joke in there. Four yeah. seasons. Oh, there's so many things to watch. <laughs> Lady Russell felt obliged to oppose her dear Anne's known wishes. It would be too much to expect Sir Walter to, to send into a small house in his own neighborhood. I do kind of understand that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all him, you know, uh, being, it's all conceit. Yeah. Right? But like, the, the I, appearance of the thing. I do understand that honestly, yeah. to, to a certain level. Like, yeah. it would be a lot easier to kind of keep up the pretense of this not being a sign of you losing right. something right. if you're going to a different uh, town. So Right, yeah. Uh, yes, of course. Obviously, you should, you know, make sure you're caught up on all of my videos before you go watch uh, The Good Place, definitely. <laughs> <clears throat> Anne herself would have found the mortifications of it more than she foresaw, and to Sir Walter's feelings, they must have been dreadful. And with regard to Anne's dislike of Bath, she considered it as a prejudice and mistake, arising first from the circumstance of her having been three years at school after her mother's death, and secondly, from her happening to be not in perfectly good spirits the only winter which she had afterwards spent there with herself. Lady Russell was fond of Bath, in short, and disposed to think, in short, and disposed to think it must suit them all. And as to her young friend's health, by passing all the warm months with her at Kellynch Lodge, every danger would be avoided, and it was, in fact, a change which must do both health and spirits good. Anne had been too little from home, too little seen. Her spirits were not high. A larger society would improve them. She wanted her to be more known. The undesirables of any other house in the same neighborhood for Sir Walter was certainly much strengthened by one part, and a very material part of the scheme, which had been happily engrafted on the beginning. He was not only to quit his home, but to see it in the hands of others, a trial of fortitude which stronger heads than Sir Walter's have found too much. Kellynch Hall was to be let. This, however, was a profound secret, not to be breathed beyond their own circle. Because I can see that's definitely a step up right like in terms of the intensity of the situation yeah like moving from your grand hall to a smaller house is actually is still going to because presumably the estate does have some income right they have tenants right. and what have you right yeah. so moving to a smaller house you need less stuff yeah less staff you are just not expected to host in such high style blah blah right. blah it would still so that would save a lot of money yeah but we're given to understand that also, they have overspent their income so often. Yeah, yeah. That, that it's, it's like take... it's more extreme. Although they were suggesting a lot of cutting back within the house. So yeah. Anyway, also if that wasn't going to work, like I don't think that taking a cottage, uh, like a small house in the area, would well, work. Like that's that's not going to be. Oh, not if in, that in one the area, doesn't work, no. then like. Anne's idea of living in a small oh, house no. in the area is definitely not going to work. No, no. I like, That would be more... The the insult to Sir yeah. Walter's I think that was wishful personality would be... On Anne's part. Yes. And as uh, Lady Russell points out, uh, it probably would have been more embarrassing to Anne than she realizes. Yeah. She just hasn't been away from home very much and so wants to stay with what's familiar and what she knows and be right. close to Lady Russell, which totally makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Oh boy, Tila, if you're actually going back and watching all of my videos, I'll apologize. Some of the early ones are a bit rough uh, and weird, but uh, <laughs> I hope that you enjoy them. I'm glad you like the, the Shakespeare quotes for everyday life video. That is one of my most popular, most watched <laughs> videos. <laughs> did you did you watch the top five worst customer service stories? That was That is my most watched video, and it also is my video with the title that is the most... Like clickbaity, <laughs> it is accurate. It's not clickbait in the sense that right. the video delivers. I, it's five customer service stories from my own life. I didn't kick add it from anywhere else. Anyway, yeah, defending myself against accusations no one has made. <laughs> <clears throat> 
Sir Walter could not have borne the degradation of being known to design letting his house. Mr. Shepherd had once mentioned the word advertise, but never dared approach it again. <laughs> Sir Walter spurned the idea of its being offered in any manner, forbade the slightest hint being dropped of his having such an intention, and it was only on the supposition of his being spontaneously solicited by some most unexceptionable applicant on his own terms, and as a great favor that he would let it at all. How quick come the reasons for approving what we like? Lady Russell had another excellent one at hand for being extremely glad that Sir Walter and his family were to remove from the country. Elizabeth had been lately forming an intimacy which she wished to see interrupted. She's 29 and still single. Give her a break. I know, right? <clears throat> it was... Uh, oh, it, oh, sorry. I said different kind of intimacy. It was with a daughter of Mr. Shepherd who had returned after an unprosperous marriage to her father's house with the additional burden of two children. She was a clever young woman who understood the art of pleasing, the art of pleasing at least at Kellynch Hall, and who had made herself so acceptable to Miss Elliot as to have been already staying there more than once in spite of all that Lady Russell, who thought it a friendship quite out of place, could hint of caution and reserve. Lady Russell indeed had scarcely any influence with Elizabeth and seemed to love her rather because she would love her than because Elizabeth deserved it. <laughs> she had never received from her more than outward attention, nothing beyond the observances of complacence, had never succeeded in any point which she wanted to carry against previous inclination. She had been repeatedly very earnest in trying to get Anne included in the visit to London, sensibly open to all the injustice and all the discredit of the selfish arrangements which shut her out, and on many lesser occasions had endeavored to give Elizabeth the advantage of her own better judgment and experience, but always in vain. Elizabeth would go her own way, and never had she pursued it in a more decided opposition to Lady Russell than in the selection of Mrs. Clay, turned from the society of so deserving a sister to bestow her affection and confidence on one who ought to have been nothing to her but the object of distant civility. From situation, Mrs. Clay was, in Lady Russell's estimate, a very unequal, and in her character, she believed, a very dangerous companion, and a removal that would leave Mrs. Clay behind and bring a choice of more suitable intimates within Miss Elliot's reach was therefore an object of first-rate importance. Uh, I can't decide if I'm with Lady Russell or not in terms of this, because I feel like usually when they're like, oh no, we, must, we mustn't allow this, yeah. this friendship. It's just because like, they think the person is, I don't know, like yeah. not classy enough for them or whatever yeah it seems at least at least a little bit of her concern is like your sister is 10 times more sensible than this woman right. you should be friends with your own dame sister right. and stop snubbing her so much instead be friendly with this conniving woman but also the whole thing about her being her unequal is yeah. like lady russell is an interesting character because she is <clears throat> very sensible and has a lot of good points yeah um but she is also very much of her time period. and Right. Which, I mean, and, I think that's and, true. They're, and her class. Like, even she's, the most, she's snobby. Yeah, even the most sensible characters, in, except in Pride and Prejudice, I think. Yeah. Elizabeth is pretty much like, fuck the class system. Yeah. In Pride and Prejudice. Like, yeah. she she almost doesn't care. Yeah. At all. Yeah. About anything. Yeah. Uh, but even even in Emma, for example, like Mr. Knightley is like, fairly sensible he's more sensible than most characters in that book right but he still has issues with emma's friendship well although i think his issues with emma's of emma's friendship with harriet have more to do with the fact that he doesn't think either of them is doing the other any good than yeah. oh emma you deserve better friends because you're rich or whatever so. yeah i think it was yeah i think his reasons were well anyway anyway we yeah. talked about that <laughs> at the time emma was an interesting book yeah Tila points out, yeah, don't shirk your sister, but Russell doesn't need to be rude with two O's. Yes. <laughs> I think we both agree. Russell, uh, Lady Russell has uh, some points, but she is also being classist. What are you going to do? Well, uh, on we that find note, out more about Lady Russell. So. Yes. Well, I look forward to it. At this point, I remember very little about the characters. I was going to ask you how much you remember. Like, I, I remember. We can talk about it after the stream, because I don't want to spoil it for anyone watching oh, who, okay. hasn't, who hasn't say, uh, read the book yet. But okay. um, we can talk about it later. Anyway, that is a perfect place to end for today. Uh, we will pick up tomorrow at 6.30 again with more uh, persuasion, with more people being persuaded to do and think things, <laughs> uh, and find out more about... And maybe actually get some thoughts from 
our heroine's own brain, finally. Mm, so far, the only person we've got, like, their actual, really in their head, is is Lady Russell and Sir Walter. Yeah. Well, we've gotten in uh, Sir Walter and Elizabeth's. Uh, Elizabeth a little bit. Elizabeth's yeah. head, which honestly doesn't take that much time. So. <laughs> Zing. Yeah. So, I mean, Sick I feel like we've. Burn. we've already plumbed the depths of their characters yeah the- i think that's that that's probably she's like look i'm just gonna like these characters are pretty easy to just sketch out so let's just get yeah. them out of the way yeah. and then we can get into more interesting characters might as well know up front our <laughs> heroine has a garbage family yeah. well anyway we'll get into more of that tomorrow with more persuasion uh thank you everyone for watching if you are new to the stream uh we'll be doing this every weekday 6 30 p.m pacific time uh there will be a playlist of all the videos which i will create now that there's a video to put in the playlist uh if you need to catch up ever um also weekends are great for catching up uh, if you want to keep watching it live uh links below to other stuff like for example my music that you can buy a collection of short stories i wrote which i released as an audiobook read by me and my friends which you can also buy links to send me tips if you're enjoying these streams which i really enjoy doing but i also um am a musician and um a freelancer and basically all of my income prior to the pandemic was event-based so it's been a real difficult time uh anyway uh yeah if you want to throw me a tip it is much appreciated um also i'm not gonna lie i included a link below to my amazon wish list because it's my birthday this saturday <laughs> just throwing it out there also for the record if i even passingly know you i will give you my address if you want to buy something from my amazon wish list from somewhere other than amazon like a small independent business yes i highly support that <laughs> yes so that is all. Good night, everyone. Um, Pepper says good night. And he hopes that you all are going to have dinner after this. But mostly he hopes that he is going to have dinner after this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Say bye-bye, Pepper. Hug your kitties and feed them. Bye. Yes, everyone go feed your pets and give them <sighs> snuggles. Yeah, he, he loves being held like this, you can tell. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. dignity. <laughs> Seriously, look at that tum, though. Look at that. Um, okay, all right, all right. He is not Bye. It. That's pepper, that's pepper language for let's get the f out of here. Yep. Oh, Benny, hi. I didn't realize you were here. I'm glad you, I'm glad you made it. Also, good night.